Welcome to the Jack and John podcast. I'm Jack. And I'm John. And we're on a mission. To help you focus on Christ. Well, you know, we were trying to find some really interesting guests. We for couldn't our find show. any. You fa- you <laughs> we failed. couldn't find any. <laughs> you guys so, failed miserably. That was way too easy. I know. <laughs> but we've got a great guest here with us today, and this is Mark Frisbee. Mark, welcome. Thank you. And uh, Mark is with uh, Prison Fellowship. So we're going to just let him introduce himself a little bit, and then we're going to beat him up here. Sweet. Um, Sweet. So, um, Mark Frisbee, uh, Prison Fellowship. I, I don't know, maybe I should explain what Prison Fellowship is. That'd be great. So, Prison Fellowship was started in 1976 by Chuck Colson. Um, Chuck was, he's infamous for being the chief legal counsel for Richard Nixon. Um, he ended up going to prison over Watergate. And he actually, I mean, he's not one of those saved in prison guys. He actually came to Christ before prison. Um, He was introduced um, to Christ through, at the time, the CEO of Raytheon. And the CEO gave him a copy of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Chuck read it and changed his life. So, but while in prison, he he saw, um, you know, the injustice of what can go on there. And when he got out, he decided... He needed to do something about the way prison was. And um, he still had a, a great deal of Washington connections. And, and so he, he ended up creating Prison Fellowship. And we are now the largest prison ministry in the world. Um, and we've been around for a long time. And for the longest time, we were really primarily just visiting those in prison and conducting Bible studies in prison. But over the last decade or so, we've refined our programs into what we call the Academy. And what the Academy is, it's a year-long program that focuses on um, spiritual development, life skills, and recovery. Because most people in prison have some kind of addiction type issue. Um, And so... It's been extremely successful. This, you know, it's 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 data driven. Um, we know that the um, that it works. The recidivism rate goes from like sixty seven down to like thirty eight, which is pretty significant. And so, um, anyway, I run the academies here in Indiana. My job is to recruit volunteers. You're actually one of my volunteers. There you go. You're not um, in the academy yet. Um, but um, he helps us with hope events, and we can talk about that in a minute. But um, so I run the academies, and I wrangle people like John. So, there you go. That was probably more than you expect, wanted, or but anyway. <laughs> no, it's just a, it's, you know it's good to have a nutshell version of it. Nut is probably the, there. You go. Yeah. <laughs> so Jack, do you have any well, just, questions? Maybe just your motivation. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know you. Right, this is sure. my first meeting you, exactly. so I have no loaded questions whatsoever. Right. I may ignorantly move into something that you don't want to talk about, no, which is fine. Good. Good. You can shut that down. But I just um, always am curious about your your drive, what inside you drives you to, to want your life work uh, to be helping people in prison. Sure. Um, that is not a question that is quickly answered. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will try and give you the Reader's Digest version the best I can. Um, you know, it's interesting. I actually did my uh, senior seminar thesis in undergrad school on Chuck Colson. And hmm. uh, well, the main reason being, um, I kind of wanted to jab my, my political science professor a little bit because he couldn't stand Chuck Colson. And so I, had to, I chose to write it on him. Um, <laughs> I had known about Colson since I was about five years old um, because, well, my, no, older, a little bit older than that. But the main reason being is, my, you know, I grew up in a, it, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a strong Christian home, um, strong Christian grandparents, very missional family. And m- my family donated consistently to Prison Fellowship and the Colson Ministries as a whole. But there's a reason I started it like that. Um, I spent the first half of my adult life in law enforcement. Um, okay. I was a brown shoe deputy sheriff um, and I, in a small county, 
um, ended up being sheriff, um, two-term sheriff. But throughout my career, I, I did everything. I was a canine officer. I was an undercover detective, worked in Indianapolis. Um, pretty much did it all. I, but my, my claim to fame, I guess you will, is I, I focused on what they call criminal interdiction. And that's finding drugs and drug money in transit. Um, and on January 4th, 1999, I made a traffic stop on I-70 of a tractor trailer that resulted in the largest interior cocaine seizure in the history of the United States. Wow. 628 kilos of cocaine, pure and uncut. Now, there are larger seizures on the border. There's larger seizures <clears throat> with intelligence, but this was a cold stop. Well, that kind of skyrocketed me into the speaking circuit, right? Uh, suddenly, I am quite literally going throughout the world teaching people how to do what I did. Um, money starts coming in. It's getting a little silly. Um, then I run for sheriff, win. Um, have a pretty good first term, run for sheriff again. Um, suddenly, I'm hanging out with this guy named Mitch Daniels. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm on a bunch of committees for him. Um, it looked like I was kind of being groomed to run for Congress in our district. And, but I had also, when I had been SWAT, gotten involved with a bunch of guys that were former military, former SWAT, and we created a security company. Um, and by security, I, I don't mean the security guy at the Walmart making sure you're not walking out with you know, whatever. <laughs> we were doing high level, high right. threat security. Um, so I'm sheriff, which makes a pretty good paycheck. And I got this security company that makes a really good paycheck. And I'm rubbing shoulders with all kinds of people. And the money is getting a little bit ridiculous. Um, with that crowd of people comes a lot of drinking. And I am, I am the CEO of this company. These guys want to know, you know, anyway, the drinking got a little out of control. I started not paying attention as much as I should to my sheriff job. Um, extremely long story short, I caught an employee embezzling federal funds. I call in the state police. They launch an investigation. I'm exonerated of any wrongdoing. This guy ends up going to prison. However, the prosecutor that was assigned to the federal prosecutor assigned to the case, he and I had a history from back when I was undercover, um, and he was not a fan of mine. And they started digging. And when you're going to dig into a sheriff, if you want to find anything, you dig into the commissary account. They did that. They came up with eleven thousand dollars that they said I had misspent. I said okay, <clears throat> and they said, well, we're going to indict you for misappropriation of funds. I said, well, that's ridiculous. Let's go to jury trial. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll go to jury trial, but then we're going to indict your secretary and your wife because they are both co-signers on that account, which makes them culpable. I was done. They had me. So I pled guilty, ended up um, in federal prison in Atlanta, which is where they sent all the major drug offenders. I am sharing a block with two guys that I had put there. Um, you can imagine my first day was not a real mm. fun day. Anyway, um, get out of prison. I I, tell them how they introduced you when you showed oh, up. Oh, yeah. So, and it's, you know, and you, let's talk about the humiliation of prison itself. Here I am. I walk in. You're stripped of everything. They hand me these, these, these foam sandals because they don't have shoes that fit me right so they hand me these foam sandals and they walk me across this yard in the rain and my sandals are disintegrating right because they're foam and i walk in to the dorm and the guard behind me he announces hey everybody sheriff's here wow. things went downhill from there but um I got out of prison on April 1st, April Fool's Day. I thought, you know, okay, I'm changing April, April Fool's Day around. It's going to be the best day of my life. That day was actually the worst day of my life because 
I had no idea what was coming, right? Um, my wife is stepping out on me. I'm, I'm, I'm losing two houses. Not um, the wife that he has Not today. the one that I have now. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. I couldn't get hired at a gas station on midnight shift selling cigarettes and gasoline. Nobody wanted to touch. Nobody wants to deal with a felon. They definitely don't want to deal with a federal felon, and they don't want to deal with a dirty cop. And I'm all three, right? Um, so I did the smart thing, what every normal person in my situation would do. I dove into a bottle, and I took one of those floating rings, you know, so I could hang out for a while. Um, and then that was my life for about the next three years. Um, get sober, get drunk, get sober, get drunk. Ended up living in my truck. Um, you know, when mom and dad couldn't deal with me anymore. You know, here I am in my 40s living with my parents. I mean, it's just, and it took a while. And, and I don't, so I never, I never cursed God. I never, I never turned from God. There were a lot of questions for God, right? But I also wasn't relying on him. I wasn't leaning into him. And, um, you know, I wish I could tell you that there was this angelic, moment where suddenly everything changed and that's just not the case. I just woke up one day and I'm like, I can't do this. Got involved in construction because um, that was the only thing I could get a job in and ended up becoming kind of co-owner of a small construction company and then through a weird set of circumstances that took me to a nonprofit on the east side, started working for them and suddenly I'm in ministry which is weird. Um, so when, when uh, you I know you're pick I'm up right there, but before you go, uh, when, when would you consider yourself born again? Um, young. I mean, okay. So you were a Christian. I, you know, I was baptized at eight. I grew up in the church. Um, <laughs> you know, do we know what we're doing at eight years old? Kind of. Um, but, but like so many people, I knew God I claimed to have a relationship with God, but I did the whole college thing. You know, I was Mr. Fraternity. I was all that. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't living it, right? I wasn't living out my Christianity. Um, and I would go back and forth on it, you know, kind of get committed, kind of not. kind of. Um, and so probably somewhere, I guess when, to answer your question, when I really focused in on it, was somewhere coming out of that drunk stage into the ministry stage. Um, and again, I wish there was some great, awesome story about when it happened. It, it just, I don't have that. Um, I'm jealous of the people that do. But, um, so I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So, I went through a couple different ministries and then um, Prison Fellowship kind of recruited me. Uh, a few years ago, and you know it was it, it was interesting because when I first gotten out of prison, I applied for a job at Prison Fellowship, and I got no response. And I, so, you know, I was a little angry about that. Of course, you know when you're just out of prison, and this is something we need to touch on. When you're just out of prison and you can't get anything going, you're playing the victim, right? Mm. Um, and so. But God certainly was not ready. I was not ready to be used by God at Prison Fellowship. So um, I had a little more seasoning to do. Um, so anyway, and that was a lot longer than you guys probably anticipated. Sorry. No, I think the big thing for me with that is it truly paints the motivation. Sure. You know. Well, think about it this way. When you were writing your paper on, on Chuck Colson, yeah. you weren't ready to be in prison ministry. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. That, that would have been the absolute farthest from my mind. Right. Life. When you were a sheriff, you, you were not ready to be in prison no. ministry. No. You and, know? But, I mean, if you think about it, what better training? Well, yeah. I mean, really. You've seen it from both sides. Absolutely. Yeah. You are the right guy. And I think that's the, that's the story that, that, to me, God used all that stuff to shape you. Uh, it, it, my, my son's a potter, okay? He, he does right. ceramics, right. all right? And uh, 
he he's often said, I don't understand this thing with you know God being the potter because I throw a lot of stuff away, <laughs> you know. But here's the thing: God can take that clay, shape it, make it whatever He wants, mm -hmm. let it sit and dry, and then decide He doesn't like it. He can still smash it, break it down, run it through all the stuff again, and then reshape it. It's not until he's put you through the fire mm -hmm. that you're ready. Yep. Because once you've been bisque fired, okay, you get fired twice, all right? Because first you shape that clay, then you fire it to harden it, mm -hmm. then you glaze it make it all pretty. <laughs> I don't think he's done that to you. Yet. No, he hasn't. He, yeah, that's, that, that's yet to come. No, then, then you glaze it, and then you fire it again. Now you've got the finished product. Thank so you. I like so. that analogy a lot better than the one I tend to use, because the one I tend to use is he was shaping me with a shovel mm. that he kept smacking oh, upside yeah. my head. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, that was a big project. <laughs> when you're using a shovel, you're not making a teacup. No, you're, uh, ma you're making something big, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Um, All right. But you know, I go back to. I I I, I kind of like to go back to Jonah on this because I I'm pretty confident I was running from God and saying I. You know, you can, you can, you can give me those orders, but I, but I ain't doing it. And it's funny because I, I was speaking to a group of guys, um, gearheads, um, in Kansas about a year and a half ago. And right before I was going out to talk, I completely changed my speech. Your speech, yeah. Completely. And, um, and man, I, I was totally winging it. And the frightening thing is it went like an hour and 10 minutes and nobody got bored. Now, I don't know if you got, if you know car guys much, but they get bored real quick. Okay. And so it, God was clearly speaking and not me, but Jonah is what came to mind to me as I was walking out. <laughs> and here's the thing about Jonah. Not only was he in the belly of a fish for three days, but the fish vomited him out, right? So Jonah's walk, Jonah is walking vomit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry, but he is. Yeah. Fish vomit. Exactly. Fish vomit. And so, <laughs> and so, but after he's fish vomit, he goes and does the job. After a shower, hopefully. Oh, don't know. Don't know. It doesn't say. It's not in there. Um, and they listen to him. Yeah. Right? Because even to this day, I question whether I am qualified to go in and talk to these guys. And there's a part of me that still doesn't want to go in and talk to mm -hmm. these guys. It's hard for me to walk back into a prison. Um, but it's also the most amazing thing I can do. Sure. Um, but they listen. You know, and that's the greatest. That's the greatest. Part you have of a captive audience. Oh, I. You know, I knew. I was hoping you'd do better than that. Really, you're not even going to laugh at that one, are you? No, I've heard it before. It's an old oh, joke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh. Uh, I used to uh, do some prison ministry, and I was in a singing group. Okay. And we had a couple of songs back in the day. One of them was "People Got to Be Free." Yep. The other one was on the other side. Okay. So we would sing those songs and right. get a big kick out of. Sure. We've got a special song for you today, sure. All the World Over. It's so easy to see. People want to be free. So. No, that's awesome. Well, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, you, you were talking about the verse in Matthew, and I should know it by heart. Um, when, when was I hungry and you fed me? Yeah, when right. Was I, Thirsty and you give me a drink. When was I in prison and you visited me? Mm -hmm. Stranger and you took me in. Yeah. And then also remember those in prison. But, I mean, if you think about Christ in the last days of his life, he literally was chosen over a dude that was not a good dude. Right? Right. 
And he literally was hanging on the cross between two not very good guys. Two not very good guys. I, I was listening earlier today, uh, third day, the song Thief. Right. Christ's last witness was to a prisoner. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And not, I mean, you know, we, we like to refer to Paul in, in a lot of, you know, they were in prison a lot. They were in prison for Christ, right? But the guy hanging on the cross next to Christ, he wasn't in prison for Christ. He was in prison because he was a bad dude. And that is the last person Christ witnessed to. And I really think we need to pay attention and to that. And showed him paradise. He, he, he said to him flat out, yeah, That's right. Today, today, you will live with, you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. Um and again, you know, we were talking about, um, well, I am so bad with chapter and verse. I probably should be better. But, you know, we were, we were talking about the woman chasing down yeah. Christ and the disciples. Um, the Gentile woman that wanted her son. Right. And, and, and Christ just kind of, yeah. he, he kind of said, you know, listen, lady, you're not deserving. And, and she said, and she said to him, she said, God, or yeah, he Rabbi. Said, he said, uh, the, the bread is meant for the children. Of, the children, yes. The children of Israel. And she was a Gentile. So, right. Thank you. But So then, then tell your. Well, yeah. And he said, he said, he said that to her. He's like, the bread is reserved for the chosen. And right. she goes, you're right. But even the dogs there eat the crumbs off the master's table. Go. And. And again, that whole story, as we were talking earlier, that story is not about Christ blowing off the woman because he wasn't. And then he said, I have not seen so great a faith in all of Israel. Bingo. Bingo. So. That was a lesson for the disciples. Yeah. Because she said, I am not worthy, but please hear me. Mm. And we are not worthy. And if we think that we are more worthy than those in prison. Got another thing right. coming. Exactly. That's um, right. So, and I think that that's a very important issue in our relationship with Christ is to understand that we are not worthy, that Jesus Christ has eternal life to offer. And uh, we're, the only way we get it is through him because nobody has that ability to give themselves eternal life or to make themselves free. Right. He sets us free. So to capitalize on your joke. If it was, if we can call it a joke. That was a joke. Oh, okay. the, the, the captive audience. The captive audience. Capitalize on the cap. Um, <laughs> because they are a captive audience. I mean, these guys are searching for something. Right. Okay, they are. For us not to bring them the word is so irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, I mean, we, you know, our, 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 our job as Christians is to witness to those around us. Um, to go and be fishers of men. Okay, well, if we're going to fish, guess what? This pond is stocked and it's full. Mm. Mm. We need to be in there. Anyway. No, I like that. Yeah. Oh, and so let's take the Christian aspect out of it for one second. Okay. Let's just do that. But pre COVID, these are pre COVID numbers, and I'm not a big statistic guy or numbers guy. There are 2.3 million people in prison in the United States. Per capita, we are the high, we, we, we imprison more people than any other country in the world. It's ridiculous. 2.3 million people in prison. And I'm not going to sit here and say that a lot of those people don't deserve to be in prison. That's, that's not what you're going to get out of me. 600,000 a year or more are released every year. So that means another 600,000 are going in. Those 600,000 people, guess what? They're coming back to a neighborhood near you. Maybe even your own neighborhood. So just as citizens, and we don't call them inmates. We just don't. We call them returning citizens. Okay, because they are citizens who have been away and they are returning. Don't we want them to have the skills the mindset, the spiritual conviction to not be the person they were that got them in there. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that should be a burden, I think, in the heart of Christians because 
Um, I, I've seen a lot of people in churches that don't have compassion on the prisoner, uh, have the attitude of they're getting what they deserve and those kinds of things. And um, I think all that needs to fall out and we need to understand that we need to have a burden for the lost. And that includes those in prison or those in a different kind of prison, in their own prison, uh, make their own walls, right? Absolutely. And um, yeah, Jesus came to set the captives free and that we were one of those. So um, we need to have compassion. I really believe that, and even empathy. Um, acceptance. Yeah, that's a better word. Well, I mean, no, all the words you used are fantastic, but acceptance. I mean, and acceptance as one of ours. You know, the, the, the biggest thing, that title fell in. Man, it's an ugly burden to carry around. I'm, I've lived it. Um, I don't let it define me. Every class, every new academy class, the first thing I do, and, and, and I need to explain, I don't actually teach these classes. I show up occasionally, but it's entirely volunteer run. And that is very critical to the class um, because the residents see that you care enough to take four hours out of your week to come into prison and teach them, right? So. But I'm always there at the beginning of, of, of each academy. And the first thing I do is, I, I, let's say I got 15 guys. We'll go around the room and I'll say one word. Describe yourself to me in one word. Learner. Okay. Center. Center. I could add to some, yeah, I won't. Um, every time I do this, Here's what I get. Thief, meth head. That's two words. Hey, okay. You, you know what I'm I saying. I got you. Um, sinner, um, drunk, addict, all of them negative. Almost every time, all of them negative, right? And so I tell them, okay, that is the last time you will think of yourself that way. Some of them say convict. That is the last time you will think of yourself that way. You are a returning citizen. You're coming back to society. You are a human. You are a child of God. And what we're going to teach you in the next year, because our goal is to help them realize the creation that God intended them to be. Okay? And I'll come back in like a month. So that's only four, say four classes. I'll come back in like a month. Okay, guys, same Absolutely. question. Mm -hmm. And it's immediately changed. It is immediate father, um, businessman, and then legitimate businessman. You know, there is a positive word, okay? Um, and that's just in the course of four, four, you know, four weeks. And what's the difference? What makes the difference in them changing that viewpoint, <sighs> do you think? I, there's a whole mess of things. Lunch is There's a whole mess of things. And probably one of the most important is the volunteer resident connection. Somebody I, caring. But bingo. Yeah. I can't stress that enough. Because when COVID kicked in, we considered, we really looked, because when COVID kicked in, we were out. Okay? Everybody was locked out of prisons. There were no programming. And here's what you got to understand. 80 to 90% of all programming in a prison is volunteer run by outsiders. So your GED classes, your welding classes, your Bible studies, all that stopped completely. So you have this group of guys who have already lost a ton of their freedom. And now every way of getting outside of their cell and dealing with their situation and has putting been, positive things in their lives has been taken is gone right okay and so we struggled we're like how can we keep this going and we looked at doing it over zoom right in fact we had these we had these media kits put together and we were we were ready to give them to you know all the facilities we realized it wasn't going to work because of that person in-person mm -hmm, right. connection.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Plus the curriculum is just amazing. I mean, uh, we use the change company curriculum and, and if you look at it, 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 it's not, it is executive level stuff. It really is. I mean, you know, I went through some Barna leadership classes. Mm -hmm. We're teaching them Barna stuff. Okay. Uh, so I don't care if you've got a GED. I don't care if you can barely read. We're teaching these, these guys and gals how to be leaders. And they eat it up. Um, just this last week, I wasn't there, but... We're about three quarters of the way through um, an academy at Edinburgh facility. And last week, the guys in the class, they ran the class. Hmm. Okay, they got up, they taught the class, um, they facilitated everything. And, and the main reason I wasn't there is even though prisons are opening back up, we're still a little bit limited on how many volunteers can go in. It's more important for me for my volunteers to go in than for me to go in. Um, but the report I've got back from the, the prison staff and my volunteers is that it was amazing. They have seen these guys who would rather fight than talk to you, get up and lead a class. Wow. Um, it's, it's impressive. It's, it's neat stuff. So there was a question that started all that. I don't remember what it was. I was just asking what was the motivation. Oh, yeah. I think. Well, you, you said um, describe yourself in one word. Mm -hmm. And then he asked oh, yeah. why the change oh, yeah. after the mm -hmm. four weeks. Yeah. They're starting to realize the creation they were intended to be. Right, right. You know, um, I, I said center. I think if you... Ask me to do it in three words. I might have said "child of God" instead. Yeah, that yeah. just sounds so much better. It does. It? Yeah. But yeah, so much is is our perspective, and I think that's the thing that changes. Mm -hmm. The guy that's sitting there in prison, or the woman that's sitting there in prison, uh, they're either playing that victim card, you know, like Huge. yeah. I, I I remember the first time I went to visit uh, the jail it wasn't prison right. it was a county jail and, and uh, I was in high school and the pastor took me because I could sing and he wanted me to sing for these guys and he spoke and uh, I, I was like nervous I right. mean, never had any experience like that sure. you know and, I, and plus I'm afraid that you know you watch these movies where there's like some kind of lockdown <laughs> you know and, and it's like and I don't, don't want to be the hostage you know and, and but I'm talking to these guys and just trying to think what to say. Right. You know, well, well, why are you here? Right. Kind of thing. And uh, the story all stand, started sounding the same because it's like, well, man, I what I really didn't do anything wrong, or um, or I was minding my own business, or it, it, it just trying to pin it on yeah. somebody else. So there's that. Sure. There's that perspective. Then there's the perspective like I'm such a terrible person. And, and I think we all can kind of get into this thing of either, you know, blaming somebody else, self-aggrandizement, mm -hmm. or you know, just whatever it is, but we've got to see ourselves the way God sees us. And I think that's the ultimate thing. I have to, sorry, tell a story. <laughs> um, Do not apologize. I po apologize, but um, I have a very good friend, or had a very good friend. He's passed on now, but uh, he, he, his name was uh, Joe Kalp. And Joe Kalp lived up in the uh, Chicago area okay. in the, on the Indiana side. And, and he, had, uh, he had studied in the University of Jerusalem. He was in the Greek Orthodox Church, okay. and he had five doctorate degrees. Wow. He had a doctorate degree in theology, ancient Bible languages, Greek. I mean, this, this man was a, a, an academia. And uh, he was very musical. That's how I met him because I was in a singing group. And at the time I met him, he was he loved our group, came and became a board member at, on our group. And um, but this is his story, and very brief. I'll just tell a very brief story. But um, a friend of his asked him to go to prison with him okay. and do a, a church service, and he wanted him to play the piano. And uh, his first uh, attitude was, I'm not going to go <laughs> into prison with a bunch of jailbirds and play the piano. That, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to do that. And his friend just uh, stayed on him and stayed on him and then made him feel guilty. So he said yes. So he went and uh, played the piano and, and the men sang, you know, just sang out. He said they just sang the songs. He just played the old hymns. Right. And uh, his friend preached. 
And then when the preacher gave the invitation, this is his words, Joe said, uh, there were five prisoners, jailbirds, that came forward and accepted Christ as their savior. And then there was six. And he went forward and oh, wow. actually got on his knees and gave his life to Christ. He uh, transitioned out of the Greek Orthodox Church, became an evangelical Christian. Oh, wow. And is one of the most dynamic men that I have ever met in my life. I used to go and stay in his house and stay up all night long and right. just ask him questions sure. and just listen to him. But he continued to do prison work and homeless shelters and right. all those kind of things. This man who had five doctor degrees because he realized that what he actually was was just a jailbird himself. He was a prisoner himself. That's a great story. And That's that awesome. Just really came out. So That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I just thought oh, yeah. they're, they're just... None, all of us are in need of the grace of God. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And without it, you know, we, we are absolutely lost. And I just think that um, this is an area that I would actually like to volunteer myself to get involved a little bit more. I, I got talk. the time. I got the time. <laughs> Let's talk. So, well, I got to tell a quick story about John. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> well, actually, you're just there. I was, you, you okay. Didn't actually do anything okay, good. good. Um, <laughs> but you're just a sinner, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> we have these programs called hope events, right? Mm -hmm. And they're a three-hour evangelical whatever. They can look like anything, but typically what they are is music and a speaker, right? okay? Um, but again, they can be anything. We've got some really interesting ones, but Edinburgh is a small facility, and it was my first one, and um, we wanted to do a hope event. It was around Christmas time, Maybe. It was cold. It I remember that. It was very that. cold. Um, and so I threw one together very quickly. Usually you plan them for a month. I called John and said, hey, what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> and um, he got um, his daughter and her roommate, Sierra, to, and we were going in and we were just going to do, it was Christmas because you were doing some Christmas music. Oh, that's right. Um, and we didn't have a big turnout. There's only 300 men at Edinburgh. And I think we had 16 guys show up. Maybe. We, didn't we do two groups, though? We did do two groups. That's right. We, yeah. did, we did two. So you can double it right. almost. Well, so John and Sierra and your daughter, they... they Julie. Julie. They, Julia. They, they did, Julia. They did the music, and it was awesome. Um, and Sierra was... Uh, she had a cajon. Yeah. You know, a beatbox. Jimbe. Right. But I had asked Sierra to speak. I had met with Sierra and I knew her, her story. Young black lady with a great testimony. And she got up and spoke. Now she was, was she, how old was she? Gosh, 24, early 20, 25, yeah, something early like that. 20s. So here you have this young black woman speaking to a bunch of Hard. white hillbillies. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And that's what they were. That, that, yeah. There might have yeah. been one or two black guys. I, I don't know. Oh, no, there was. There yeah. was one old guy. Well, there was the one young guy that, that uh, I, I don't remember if he sang or not, but Amon Amadeus was his oh, name. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, the important thing is, now, this happened in the second service. And, and I, I'll tell you what, Sierra, she got up there and, man, she brought it. I mean, she brought it. And basically, she was saying, guys, get it together, get with Christ, get out and be a father. Okay? Um, well, there's this old white guy sitting in the front row. And I just, I'm watching him while she's talking, and tears start flowing, right, on this guy. Tears are dangerous in prison. Okay? And we, what we do is we put these guys in positions that are not allowed. Okay, you don't show weakness. Right. Okay. Here's this guy sitting here, and he's covered in tattoos, and um, tears start coming down. Sierra goes over, and she wraps her arms around him and hugs him. And man, he and that's kind of a no-no. We're not supposed to. Right. Okay. But we had prison officials in there, and I looked, and they gave the nod like it's okay. And these two are in this embrace. He's got this gigantic Aryan Nation tattoo across wow. the back of his neck. You, you see where I'm at? I do. You I see do. the point here. Yeah. And he talked to her for 20 minutes. Wow. 
Okay, so that barrier was broken. That's awesome. Yeah, and um, did you even notice that? I, it, I don't know that I. I don't I, know that I, I talked about it much. I didn't hang on that moment. Okay, you know, but um, yeah, because there was a lot going there, on. There, there was. There was a lot. Yeah. A lot that happens, um, and I've got you roped into some more hope events Good. coming up. Um, you don't even know what you're doing. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like I'm. Probably going to... That'd be great. Yeah. I would um, love it. Anyway, um, the week after Mother's Day, you guys are both busy. Uh, uh, but that was the, the story. Your story reminded me of that story because here's somebody on the right. complete opposite end Opposite of that, end of the scale. And he realizes his need. And he realizes what he's yeah. been wrong about. Yeah. Anyway. Well, so... We let me, you, let, yes, let me kind go, of sum go for this it. up. Yes, do it. Um, for me, yeah, I, I go back to Exodus and God and Moses are chatting and God goes, hey man, your people keep crying out to me. Tell them to move. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And we spend a lot of time in prayer which we have to do. But I don't think we spend near enough time in prayerful action. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And, you know, it's real easy, and I'm not, I'm not downplaying this. It's real easy to show up at the church on a Saturday and stuff boxes with food that are going out to somebody that needs it. I've done it, and it's great. It's a good thing. It's an absolute yeah. good thing. But what I need, and what... The guys and gals behind jail, behind in jail need, they need people to get their hands dirty and get ready to be messy and take on the prayerful action. So there's a challenge in that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If you will. You know, when we're getting ready for this thing, I, I'm thinking about, I'm always thinking about, okay, what verses do we need to use or how's God going to speak mm -hmm. through this thing? And of course, looked up the Matthew 25 mm -hmm. where Jesus is talking about, you know, you visited me in prison or you didn't visit me right. in prison. Um, but the, the verse that just keeps ringing in my head is, is in first Corinthians where Paul is saying, you know, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, or if I have all kinds of wisdom and knowledge, mm -hmm. if I say all the right things, but I don't have love. I'm just a noisemaker. I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And, and I think that's where the, the rubber meets the road kind of thing. Right. You know, we can, we can pray, we can talk, but man, if we're not demonstrating it with love, um, where does that leave us? And the one I was thinking of the whole time, got to throw my sense in. Yeah, please. No, nonsense in. No. <laughs> um, is, is in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that he holds the key. Yeah. To sets the captives free, and he holds the key to death, to Hades, and um, sets the captives free. And I just think that gee, when we take Christ in, even if it's just as Christians bringing his presence in, to these people and just being there and showing concern and genuine compassion and love that uh, he can do powerful, mighty things through little folks like us and I, little folks like yeah. anyone else. Absolutely. I would encourage you, if you're, you're burdened for those people, you have a way you can step out now. Well, I mean, if you look at my volunteers, I've got... A New York Italian attorney. <laughs> He's awesome. I've got a retired psychologist, school teacher, um, former DOC employee, truck driver. I mean, it's the whole gamut. Um, the thing that unites him is Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, Mark, thanks a lot for being here with us. Uh, just absolutely love having you here. Um, folks, I hope that you've been challenged by what you've heard today and you know, most of all, 
I hope that God's working on your heart and that you're feeling a call to action. It doesn't have to be to come and help out with prison fellowship, um, but a call to reach out to those around you um, and also to dig into your own heart and realize that, that we're all captives. We're all the least of these. We're, we're all on the same level. There is, I said this when we went to the Hope event and I was talking to these men uh, before we sang. I said, there's no greater equalizer than the foot of the cross. The ground is level. That's yep, right. The, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And that's where we all are. Um, when you think about prison, when you think about prison fellowship, think about Jesus. Think about visiting him in prison. Um, God bless you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for listening. Please share us with your friends. Um, we'll see you next time.